I gave a introduction to the area of uh, this uh, transaction processing and error recovery. So, so we looked at what what exactly is a transaction, and then what are the various uh, responsibilities of the programmers involved? What are the important properties? The atomic city, consistency, isolation, and durability properties of uh, the transaction systems in general, and then you know which of these things is the responsibility of what subsystem of the uh, system. So we looked at uh, all that. So today we will focus first on the the issue of managing concurrency appropriately. Okay. So concurrency is an important aspect. We have to allow these multiple uh, processes. Of, okay, of this each process is a invocation of one of these transaction programs. So so multiple processes to run concurrently, and in the in this context, we should also ensure that the system maintains consistency of the database. So, so how does uh, so what what are the various how, how do we approach this problem? How do we model it? And how do we uh, look at uh, the so uh, what are the kind of solutions that are uh, possible in this case? So we will uh, broadly uh, look at uh, the concurrency uh, control sub module uh, today. So let me go over uh, the last slide that we were looking at in the last lecture. Basically, we just said that the <coughs> the database model for transaction processing is based is that we we think of the database as consisting of several items, and each of these items is independently accessible, and then uh, the transactions will ask for these items, modify them, and then write them back. Okay. So usually we make an assumption that this item, uh, the granularity of this item is that it's a block or a page, and then uh, transactions, uh, transactions only operate by exchanging data with the database server only. They don't exchange messages between them, and we will focus on uh, these the read, write. Commit and about operations. We will look at commit and about operations in the last class. <coughs> Briefly gave you uh, as to what those things stand for, and uh, we actually will not be able to uh, at this stage not be able to fully appreciate what should happen in commit and what should happen in about uh, unless we also study the recovery procedures. So we will come to that in the in the next uh, uh, week actually. Okay. And we also said that the transactions uh, should not be nested. Okay, so with this background, let me uh, go a little <coughs> more closely at this operations of these transactions. So let us develop some notation for representing these things. So R I of X, <coughs> this symbol will stand for the read operation of transaction I. So, since we have we are going to mix the operations of the transactions, several of them, a bunch of them together, and then start talking about them. So, we need to distinguish between the various operations of each of these transactions. So, we use this transaction number as a subscript for these uh, operations. So, our subscript i indicates that uh, so the i is the transaction number, and uh, the transaction is doing a read. And the DB item is X. So what exactly happens uh, when you <coughs> do a read I read X is that the disk block having this particular item X is copied to the buffer page from the uh, disk if required. So it's possible that some other transaction has you know requested for the same item a little earlier, and so the page is actually lying uh, on the memory in the memory. Okay. So, if it is required, it will be brought from the disk to the buffer page, buffer space. So, copy to the buffer uh, pages. So, we will think of the buffer as something which has a number of these pages which are all equivalent to the, the disk block size. So, the disk box will be first brought into the buffer page and then they will be made accessible to the transactions. And then <coughs> the required value, whatever is the value, is assigned to some program variable x. So, 
even though the the uh, page is brought the entire information about uh, page may not be actually used so whatever is required by the program it will be assigned to it okay so the read is that and then similarly wix i means again the transaction i so a particular transaction uh, i uh, is doing this write operation so so it writes uh, db item x so again if you have to update the uh, db item x so you, you need to have the disk block containing uh, this item x so if it is required if it is not already present in the uh, buffer pages then it has to be brought from the disk and then and then made available to the transaction so the, the transaction will update the buffer value using this program variable whatever is the we have some internal um, uh, the, the program space is there the program has its own memory space right so it is maintaining some values um, as it is running in in memory so those values will be transferred to these buffer pages and then they will be transferred back to the uh, disk so um, when you do a write the transfer of the block to the disk might happen immediately or might happen later so this actually depends on the kind of recovery protocol that we are going to adopt so for the moment we will think of it as the transfer of the block to the disk will happen okay, at some later point of time okay either immediately or a little later it will happen so unless it happens actually the 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 right operation is not fully uh, successful you can see that okay <coughs> okay so that's right and then we have c of i to say the transaction uh, uh, wants to commit so transaction commits and a of i to indicate that uh, a transaction wants to abort so so these are the uh, transaction um, operations uh, and we just thought of them as read write commit about uh, in the earlier uh, lecture but now we are giving uh, more detail to that so the transaction number comes as the subscript and the item that is actually being read or written comes uh, inside the brackets okay so with this uh, notation we will be able to set up <coughs> what is called uh, uh, a transaction uh, a schedule of transactions okay we will we will set up that okay so before we go into that let us briefly discuss the need for uh, concurrency control i think we can actually intuitively feel the need for the concurrency control because if more um, multiple processors try to uh, you know access the same um, item then we know that there is there are problems there are going to be problems so let's give some uh, 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 you know clarity to that uh, so so these uh, anomalies are the problems that are going to occur when you interleave operations of multiple um, transactions in an arbitrary way it can be kind of classified into um, write read anomalies or read write anomalies or write write uh, anomalies i will show you uh, these things in a short while so write read anomalies are they are also called dirty reads in, in our context in the context of databases we call them as dirty reads it becomes clear now why it is there so the transaction pi let us say p1 is in progress so it is updating values in a, in a particular column let us say that. and then um, so the system allows transaction p2 to kind of read a value x that has been already updated by uh, p1 make use of that value compute some other quantity and also finish by finish it says that i am committing and quitting so suppose the system allows this kind of a thing then the transaction t1 is still in progress so after this entire uh, t2 has read the value x and then make use of it and and then finish uh, t1 for some reason might actually decide saying that no 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 i did a mistake in uh, updating this x value i'll have to go back and then change it back to the original value notice that as a programmer i have the 
I have the freedom to do many things with the database. So I might, you know, programmatically decide at, at a later point of time that this has been some mistake. And so I'll have to, I might want to do a change back to the original value. Also, this might happen because uh, uh, due to some reason we detected that the transaction T1 is not, you know, following rules properly and things like that. The system might itself might, uh, you know, uh, decide to roll back the operations of the transaction T1. In which case, the value that it has changed has to be brought back to the original value. So, in, in, in this context, what happens is that there is a write that happened and there is a read that happened. And there is a uh, cancellation of the write that's happening, and so essentially what happened is that this T2 has read some dirty data. It, it is read some intermediate data, or it's also called dirty data because it's not correct data, and so got into trouble. Okay, actually, as a part of the solution for this issue, uh, T2 actually might. Um, having read X, having made use of the X, it can also actually wait for a while, see what exactly happens to T1 and then decide to do whether to finish or not, okay. So, but without going all, uh, without doing all such kind of things, uh, T2 in a hurry has, uh, you know, updated uh, and claimed that it has completed its uh, work and quits. And suppose the system allows this, then this kind of a dirty read problem will arise. So, this is a dirty read uh, kind of <coughs> situation, it is called uh, like that. It is an anomalous uh, situation, we would like to avoid that. Here are the other kind of uh, uh, unrepeatable reads, we call them as unrepeatable reads. So, this is a rewrite anomaly. So, T1 has read a value x and intends to actually read it again before changing it. Between these two reads of x by the transaction T1, some other transaction T2 reads x, modifies it, and finishes. Fits. So, when T1 reads the value of x the second time, it gets a different value. So, the, the, read, the read that you have done is not a repeatable read that means you get two different values when you read the same thing without you updating it. That means somebody else has interfered into your work basically right. So, you you read a very uh, item from the database and then you again read it you have not modified it yourself and you try to read it after a little while you expect the same value to be there because you you are guaranteed being guaranteed isolation. Right, but that does not happen here because something else has come and then changed. It. So, this kind of an issue again is because the uh, system allowed T2 to read uh, X without bothering about what is happening to it. So, this kind of a thing is what is called unrepeatable um, uh, read problem and it causes a uh, lot of uh, issues, <coughs> and so we should try uh, and avoid this kind of um, situations. So, all this actually is happening because two transactions are trying to access the same database item in, in some order or the other. This problem called WW anomaly or lost update problem, it is also called lost update problem, also happens in a kind of a similar way. So, T1 reads an item X and reduces by 10 percent and wants to write it. It has not yet written it, okay. It has done a, a 10 percent reduction, but it has not yet written it. T2 reads the same value x, T2 reads the same value x before it was actually updated by x, that means the same original value x and increments it by 20 percent and it wants to write. So, T1 write, uh, wants to increase it by uh, decrease, uh, uh, reduce it by 10 percent uh, and T2 wants to increase uh, same value by 20 percent. Now, both of them are attempting to write. So, whichever write happens first will actually win 
so in some sense say, say right of t1 happens then and after that the right of t2 happens let us say. Uh, so, the final value is actually 1.2 times x only. So, whoever actually has written first has actually lost its update. You can see that. So, right of t1 happened and then that of t2 happened, but then the final value is what t2 wrote. So, what is the final uh, whatever the uh, value that was written by t1 was overwritten by t2. And so, the update that was made by T1 which is a 10 percent reduction was actually lost in the process. So, this issue is what is called a lost update problem. So, you might have actually studied these kind of uh, issues uh, in you know uh, in processors trying to access memory variables you know simultaneously and things like that in an operating system uh, course context also. So, and you would have seen this you know memory traces and things like that similar kind of issues come up there right. Anyway, so these things are very real problems uh, in the in the context of our uh, transactions also and and basically these are the various things that we should avoid actually as uh, as uh, when we are controlling the, the concurrency <coughs> ok. So, let us move ahead. Um, here is an important notation that we make use of in order to uh, model the interleaved operations of a bunch of transactions. A bunch of transactions are currently running you know, kind of admitted and they are all running. So, we want to take a uh, you know a peek into how they have actually happened ok. What is the exact interleaving of the operations of these transactions? So, we need a model for that. So, we need a notation for that. So, let us let us uh, represent it like this. So, it is it's actually easier to uh, view it in, in a table or kind of form. So, time is progressing this way. Uh, these are the individual operations of uh, the transaction T1. So, since they are, they are in the column T1, we did not put the uh, subscripts here. So, they are in the column T2. So, that means they are all uh, you know of uh, transaction T2. So, we do not put the subscripts in a similar way these are and this is the timeline you can see that in each timeline there is only one event one one operation right. So, at any point of time the, there is a uniprocessor model at any point of time one of these operations is happening ok. So, so this is the interleaving of operations of transactions that is happening. Now, since uh, each time writing this uh, uh, picture uh, is difficult, so we have a notation for that. So, what we will do is we will write this as r 1 x r 1 x then the next thing is r 2 y transaction 2 uh, is writing a reading y. So, r 2 y then so next if you go to next time step is r 3 x. So, we write it r 3 x and then w 1 x then uh, then w 3 x w 3 x and then finally w 2 y. So, we write this in this particular sequence and we call this as the transaction schedule or history of the transaction operation. So, we assume that there are a bunch of three transactions running and this is the particular way in which the operations of the transactions were are interleaved by the system and run by the system. So, we have a, a notation for that. Now, we use this notation to kind of study the properties of these schedules and then actually define what is a desirable property for the uh, schedule and then see how exactly that kind of schedules will will actually happen in the, in the system. Okay. So, this is just a notation for uh, representing the histories of um, the running. It is also not fully complete because we have actually not put the commit uh, about uh, uh, commit operations of this transactions also ok. It is kind of incomplete 
uh, schedules. Okay. Now, in the context of these uh, transaction histories or schedules, uh, this is another uh, important um, thing. Uh, we call something as a serial schedule. A serial schedule is where you know no such interleaving actually happens, no interleaving happens. So, all the operations of one particular transaction come together. In this case, they all come in one T1, T2, T3 in that order, but the order that actually does not matter. We may put uh, operations of T3 first and then operations of uh, T1 first and then the operations of T2 also. So, as long as all the operations of a particular transaction all together in the schedule, we we'll call such a schedule as a serial schedule. Essentially, it is operating, uh, there is no interleaving. So, we call such a, a serial schedule. Notice that we have you know discussed earlier, I mean that if you have serial, serial schedules, then there is no issue of any any problems arising at all because we are doing one transaction at a time essentially, there is no interleaving, but then the transaction throughput will be very slow because you are uh, you are kind of waiting for these reads, writes, uh, and uh, this operations to finish and all that. So, serial schedules are you know they do not pose any concurrency problems at all, but then they are uh, practically not useful because they are um, they will slow down the system ok. But here is a, a schedule uh, notation for serial schedule. Uh, so, all the operations of the transaction uh, one a particular transaction all together. Okay. Okay. So here comes a very important new term called serializability. If you type it in word, it will give you a spelling error. Actually, we use this term often in a database context. This is called serializability. S serializability um, is defined uh, a little later. So, right now, ok. So, serial schedules, I we have seen that there are no interleaving of operations of different transactions and they, uh, they do not cause uh, concurrency problems, but then the performance is low. A question arises is that is there some interleaving of these all, all these operations which in some sense in some sense equivalent to a serial schedule ok. If it in if the interleaving actually happens, but somehow that interleaving is is in some sense equivalent to a serial uh, schedule. If such a thing can be set up then we will call such things as serializable schedules. They are not actually serial schedules, but then they are in some sense equivalent to serial schedules. So, we will call such kind of schedules a serializable schedule. And if we somehow can realize this serializable schedules in practice, then we are a little better off compared to uh, uh, you know having to use serial schedules. Okay. So, what is this sense of equivalence? That is what we will now uh, define and set up. So, uh, the effect of this interleaving is same as that of some serial schedule. If that is the case, we will call them as serializable schedules. So, but this one is vague because we, we have not really uh, told as to what is that equivalence and things like that. So, let me make this uh, a bit uh, much more precise now ok. Now, in order to make this precise, we need to have uh, uh, to uh, a definition calling what are called conflicting pairs of operations, what are conflicting pairs of operations within a schedule because it is all this conflicting pairs of operations uh, that are going to actually cause problems for us. So, let us set them up and then discuss them uh, how to handle them. So, 
a pair of operations in the schedule. Okay. So, okay. So there is this or uh, this kind of schedule, right? So we, we are picking up some pair of operations, and they are said to be in conflict if the operations belong to two different transactions. Operations belong to two different transactions. Both the operations are dealing with the same database item, and one of them is a write operation. This is precisely the kind of, you know, pairs of problems, pairs of operations that are actually was causing lot of these issues like this, lost update problems uh, and uh, repeated uh, all those uh, problems. Okay. So let me show you. Uh, in this uh, in this schedule, uh, let us identify the conflicting uh, pairs of uh, operations. So, uh, so this transaction T2 is actually all dealing with Y, whereas T1 and T3 are dealing with X. So, T2 operations actually do not conflict with anybody because they do not share the same database size, right? That is clear, right? So, T1 operations, of course, uh, any of the operations of the transaction do not conflict to themselves, they are, they are in the sequence order, they, they are all. Uh, so, TRX conflicts with, it does not conflict with the, uh, this RX because both of them are read operations, one of them has to be write operation. So, RX conflicts with WX. You can see Rx conflicts with Wx, and this Rx conflicts with w, that Wx because they are both referring to the same item. One of them is write operation; they belong to two different transactions. Same is the case with this Wx and this. There are three pairs of conflicting operations uh, here uh, in this particular. Uh, schedule. So, given any schedule, you will be able to figure out as to what are the conflicting pairs of operations there. Okay, is that clear as to what are conflicting pairs of operations? Let me repeat there are operations that belong to two different transactions, two different transactions, both of them dealing with the same database item, and one of them is a right operation. Okay. So now, now that we have understood what are conflicting pairs of operations, we are in a position to define an, a notion of equivalence. A notion of equivalence. <coughs> uh, this notion of equivalence is specifically called conflict equivalence because it focuses on a certain aspect. So it's called conflict equivalence, not a general. It is called conflict. So, a schedule S1, now we gave names for these schedules because we have to talk about the multiple schedules and then see which are desirable, which are not desirable. So, a schedule S1 is said to be conflict equivalent to some schedule S2 if the relative order among any pair of conflicting operations is actually the same in both S1 as well in S2. So, you, you are having two schedules and then you focus on this conflicting pairs of operations. Each conflicting pair of operations will have certain uh, you know one read occurring and write occurring and things like that. So, you look at them if the conflicting pair occurs in the same order in both S1 and S2 for all of those conflicting pairs then we call them as conflict equivalent. Okay, let me show you an example. Let us take the same uh, schedule. <coughs> so, this is what is there. So, R 1 x this is what is there in the table R 1 R 2 R 3 W 3 W 2 W 2 y. Finally, w. Now, this is conflict equivalent to this one. You can notice that if you take this uh, the the yellow ones, uh, there there is a conflicting pair of operations. 
R1 X W3 X R1 X W3 X they are occurring in the same order in here and also here and in a similar way if you take this uh, violet ones um, R3 X W1 X they are also occurring in the same order R3 X W1 X. Okay. And then if you take this uh, underlined one R3X and W3X, uh, that is the, uh, uh, there is some issue here, right? yeah, I think there is some, uh, one of them subscript has to be corrected, corrected. So, let us look at all the three. So, uh, so this R1X, W3X, they are in the same order and then, um, this R3, W3, R3, W3, R3, W3 and so and this one finally W1X and W3X. So, I ok, W1X and W3X ok, these even these are actually in the same order ok. Now, that is uh, so what exactly happened between this and this? What we just did is to actually position this w 2 y little inside. So, w 2 y we kind of pushed it up, pushed it to this position and then pushed this these two operations down in the same order ok and we got a uh, schedule, we got a slight different schedule, but then it is equivalent to the conflict equivalent to the upper schedule whatever it is. Now, if you do something similar, but if you change the order among these conflicting pairs of operations, obviously you will not have conflict equivalence. ok. So, now the uh, I have done something like this. So, simply swap what is it that got swapped here? You can just see R1 X R2 Y R. So, W3 and W1 X compared to this, I swapped them and got into a, a, a different schedule. So, this obviously is not equivalent to the other one, conflict equivalent to the other one because you can see that, uh, yeah, in this for this conflicting pair of operations, the relative order in which they are occurring is different in both these things. Okay. Now, why is this useful? What is this use of this conflict equivalence? Let us see. Now, our idea here is that having developed this notion of equivalence, kind of make use of it to say that, okay, if there is some schedule, if it is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule, some serial schedule, if it is equivalent conflict equivalent to some serial schedule, then it is going to be useful for us ok. So, so that is why we bring in a specific notion of serializability, the serializability is a, a bit more general notion saying that it is useful for uh, you know it it uh, it is useful for realizing concurrent, uh, good concurrency control, but here is a more specific uh, you know property called conflict serializability. So we define some schedule as conflict serializable schedule. Okay, if it is conflict equivalent to some serial schedule, and how many serial schedules are there? If there are some ten number of transactions, there will be factorial 10 number of serial schedules because you can uh, you know position them in factorial 10 number of uh, different ways ok. So, depending on how you position the, the, those uh, tailors will finish uh, you know at, up, at different times and all that, but we are not concerned much about how when they finish, but we are concerned about when our correctness and you know all that consistency and all that ok. So, what we are doing here is that now we are saying that interleaving of operations is ok as long as the, the particular interleaving that you have done is actually equivalent to some serial schedule. What is that equivalence notion? Conflict equivalence notion. So, what does it mean? So, 
in this particular schedule which we are calling it as a conflict serializable schedule the conflicting pairs of operations are actually occurring you know in the same order as they are under, uh, occurring in some serial schedule in some serial schedule so in in effect the the effect of this particular conflicting uh, conflict serializable schedule is in some sense equivalent to that serial schedule to which it is conflict equivalent. So, that is what we are going to make use of ok. Uh, another way in which we can actually define this conflict serializability is to say that if you focus on non, con, non conflicting uh, pairs of uh, uh, operations and then somehow you know move them around move them ok. Uh, so, that the schedule uh, in question becomes a serial schedule ok I will let me illustrate that. Ok, so let us take this uh, uh, now this schedule in picture is definitely not conflict serializable because what are the possibilities here to, con to, to kind of realize conflict serializability. Uh, so, the question that we are asking is that is this particular schedule conflict equivalent to some serial schedule? What are the uh, serial schedules that are possible? Uh, uh, so, I can put uh, among the T1 and T2, I can either put all the operations of T1 before the operations of T3, ok. And the operations of T2 actually do not matter because uh, the T2 is all operating on Y and does not really conflict with anybody. So, I can put the operations of T2 all the way you know before or all the way later etcetera does not matter. Whereas, if you focus on the operations of T1 and T3, if you try and you know uh, check if this particular schedule is conflict equivalent to a serial schedule in which T 1 comes before T 3 in which T 1 comes before T 3 if you try to do that then. So, what does it mean? So, uh, this W x this W x ok should come before this R x only then this T 1's operations will be before the operations of T 3 in that serial schedule, right. So, if you try making this particular uh, schedule that is given in the picture conflict equivalent to a schedule in which the operations of T 1 come before the operations of T 3, then obviously, this second pair will be out of order. This, this pair will be out of order because they are right now here like this R x comes first and then W x comes. But then if you are trying to put operations of T 1 before the operations of T 3, then the relative order among this uh, pair will get disturbed ok. So, I cannot try with uh, try showing that this particular schedule is conflict equivalent to some schedule in which operations of T 1 come first and then the operations of T 3 come later. In a similar way, if you try to argue that T 3 operations are let me try to put uh, put before the operations of T 1 ok. Then also, then also the other pairs will get disturbed. So, let us try uh, let me. So, trying to put a T 3 before T 1 what it means is that I should I should actually bring this uh, 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 or should I should take these things all the way up here ok. If you try to take all these things all the way up here uh, then this pair and this pair will actually get disturbed because you are trying to take this w x all the way above. So, 
that is the only way you can realize uh, a serial schedule uh, involving P3 operations before the P1 operations. So, either way and these are the only two possibilities either T1 should come first or P3 should come or P3 should come or T1 should come later. They are the only two possibilities and in both possibilities we can see that uh, this particular schedule that we are considering uh, is not conflict equivalent to either of these two and that is why this schedule is not a conflict realizable schedule. There is some inherent problem here, there is some inherent problem. You can actually feel that there is some kind of a cyclicity problem here. Okay. So, we, we will make that a little bit more concrete. Okay. Now, to illustrate uh, the uh, situation, uh, uh, a, a slightly better situation where we can realize conflicts uh, realizability for this particular schedule, let me change it slightly. Okay. Let us focus on this example and then change it slightly, a slight change to our example. What is the change I have done is to simply swap these two operations, swap this and this. So, I put Rx here and Wx above. The same conflicting pairs of operations are occurring, but then, but then you can actually immediately see, I suppose if you are following me, you will be able to immediately see that this particular schedule in which I have Rx, Ry, Wx, Rx, Wx, Wy is equivalent to conflict equivalent to a schedule in which operations of T1 come before the operations of T3. In any schedule in which the operations of T1 come before the operations of T3, this is equivalent to that. And the, uh, the operations of P2 do not matter. So, just because just by swapping these two uh, things, uh, we are able to uh, show that this is indeed conflict equivalent. So, S2, S2 is conflict equivalent to serial schedules. In fact, it is it is equivalent to all these serial schedules T1, T3, T2. T1, T2, T3, T2, T1, T3. Of course, it is not conflict equivalent to T3, T1, T2. It is not conflict equivalent to T3, T1, T2. Because if you try to get T3, T1, T2, then you will you will basically these are conflicting pairs of operations. You will actually all you know swap them all. All of them you will be trying to reverse which is not possible because this is the order in which they have been given to us in the initial schedule. Okay, so, this notion of conflict equivalence is a very important one. I, I, I hope you have understood uh, the, the uh, importance of, uh, I mean, I hope you have understood the definition uh, properly. So, the definition just says that focus on conflicting pairs of operation, the relative order in which they come should be the same in some serial schedule. It does not matter what serial schedule it is, but it, as long as that is a serial schedule, okay, then we call the given schedule as a conflict serializable schedule, serializable. It is not a serial schedule, but it is realizable. Okay. Now you can also you can also see that um, okay. So if you focus on non-conflicting pairs of operations here, non-conflicting pairs of operations. For example, uh, this Rx, uh, this Rx is not conflicting. This Ry and this Rx are not conflicting, etc. So this Wy is actually not conflicting with anybody. So what we can do is to swap it with this. So this Wx comes down, this Wy will go up. That's what I mean by swapping. So 
So, if you swap it, then the swapped uh, schedule is actually conflict equivalent to the given schedule that you can see, right? Suppose I do a one swap, uh, I take this wy here and then put wx here. This wy is not involved in any conflicting pair of operations and so it does not disturb any relative order of any conflicting pairs of operations in the given schedule and so it will be equivalent to the given schedule. Do, do you get me? Yeah. So, like that as long as this does not conflict with the immediate operation uh, to which I am swapping, I can actually swap it all the way up like this and continue to maintain equivalence of the schedule before and after swapping. Okay, do you get the point? So, like that now you can see that I can actually swap R y with this R x. I can bring the R x down and then break, take R y R y up. It does not change the relative order of any conflicting operation. So, I will continue to be. So, what I can do is what I can do is actually I can do many things like this. So, for example, I can take this R y swap it down all the way here. I can move it all the way down here because it is not conflicting with this. So, I can uh, move this up and then this down and it is not conflicting with this. So, I can move uh, this down and this up like that I can actually swap it all the way there. Then what actually happens? So, you can see that this this schedule has become a serial schedule. Why? All the operations of T 1 coming, then the operations of T 3 are coming. I have brought this down all the way here. So, operations of T 2 are coming later. Okay. So, it has become equivalent to it has uh, been turned into an equivalent state. So, why I am telling all this is that one way of checking whether a given schedule is in fact equivalent to a conflict equivalent to some uh, conflict equivalent, I am sorry, conflict serializable, given schedule is conflict serializable, is to try and focus on non conflicting pairs of operations within the schedule and swap them around to ensure that the given uh, uh, schedule can be turned into some serial convenient serial schedule. Okay. So, in this case actually you can later verify that you can turn this S 2 into either T 1 T 3 T 2 or T 1 T 2 T 3 or T 2 T 1 T 3. All these things you can do by just moving the non conflicting pairs of operations or swapping. Okay. So, that is the notion of conflict equivalence. So, in order to actually check whether something is conflict equivalent or not, we can actually construct what is called a precedence graph of a schedule, precedence graph of a schedule, ok, precedence graph is also called serialization graph. So, the nodes represent uh, transactions here and there is a directed arc from the T i to T j. If an operation of T i precedes the operation of T j in the schedule, precedes means comes before and conflicts with it, okay, and conflicts with it. If that is the case, we can put a R. So, essentially, we are actually again uh, representing uh, the conflicting pairs of operation by R's. And then we can say that we can redefine this conflict serializability in terms of this precedence graph saying that S schedule S is conflict serializable if or of this precedence graph is acyclic. Okay. The precedence graph is acyclic, then we can uh, define that the schedule is conflict serializable. In fact, you can see that uh, the, the different topological sorts of the acyclic uh, uh, graph. Um, will give you equivalent scale schedule. So, I can show you the picture for these two uh, just now we consider these two diagrams right. 
So, you can take this diagram T1, T2, T3, this is the original diagram that I gave you uh, and this is the slightly modified diagram. So, we notice that this slightly modified diagram is actually complex serializable whereas, the original was not complex serializable. So, you can also check it by constructing the precedence graph here. So, the precedence graph here uh, has uh, T1, T2, T3 as the nodes representing the transactions and now if there is a conflicting pair of operations and one precedes uh, the other then there is a arc from T1 to T3. You can verify that later in the definition. So, because of this T1 to T3 arc comes into picture. Now, because of this, this conflicting operations and this precedes that T3 precedes the operations of T3 precedes that of T1. So, because of this, this arc comes into picture. So, the cycle comes into picture because of that and T2 is of course happily in between. Whereas, here you can see that because of this swap that we have done, uh, this all these things contribute to exactly one arc. There is a conflicting pair of operations, but this uh, uh, T1 precedes T3 in that. This also T1 precedes T3. And this also T1 precedes T3. And so it's actually all of them contribute to this arc, but it, that arc is like this. So you can see that. Okay. So, using precedence graphs or serialization graphs, one can actually check whether a particular uh, schedule is in fact serializable or not. So, there are multiple ways of doing this serializable, serializability, conflict serializability check. One is by constructing the precedence graph, the one, other one is by checking whether it is actually equivalent to a serial schedule and that you can do by uh, by actually swapping non conflicting pairs of operations and then uh, reducing the given schedule to some serial schedule. So, these are the multiple ways in which we can check serializability.